Good morning and welcome to today's Friends Life Care Vigor Wellness Webinar, Home Simplified, How to Create a Calm, Organized Home with Con uh, Mari. My name is Gail Tamarchio and I'm the Friends Life Care Director of Wellness Initiatives and I'll also be your moderator today. Um, so I'd just like to go over a few housekeeping tips before we get started with our presenter, Amanda Jefferson. Um, the links to today's handout is in the um, confirmation email that you received an hour before the webinar. And then um, a link with today's slides and additional information from Amanda will also be included in the follow-up email that you'll receive on Wednesday afternoon with a link to the recording of today's presentation. So you will be asked a poll question during the presentation. All you have to do is just click on your answer and hit enter and we'll get your, I'll be able to register your vote. And um, we do not have a chat feature enabled today, but we do have a Q&A box and you can ask questions at any time during the webinar and Amanda will answer all your questions. Um, she is going to stop halfway through the webinar and then she'll take questions again at the end, but she did agree if she gets overwhelmed with questions, she can answer them um, during the webinar too. So just um, be sure to do that. If you don't see your Q&A um, box, all you have to do is just kind of run your cursor on the bottom of your screen. If you're on a computer or an iPad and you'll see the um, Q&A, just click on that and you can type your question in. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Amanda Jefferson. Now, Amanda is the owner of Indigo Organizing and one of the world's first KonMari consultants. She left an inspiring yet stressful 20-year career to start her own business because she believes that we're all too frazzled, and I agree with her. Um, <laughs> she helps people have less stuff, less stress, more space, and more time for what matters. Sounds very good to me. Um, and while she's not working with her amazing clients, and so far she's logged over a thousand client hours, um, she's talking to groups across the country about how to simplify life at work and at home. And if you're interested in learning more about it, you can find um, Amanda at um, indigoorganizing.com and on Instagram at, at indigo underscore organizing. So Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to your presentation and what you have to say. Thank you so much, Gail. Thanks for hosting today. Um, I'm so glad to have you as my co-pilot here as I go through this because I'm really going to be needing you to help me with question and answers as we go and interrupting me if you really feel like we've got tons of answers coming through, qu questions coming through. So as Gail said, I'm Amanda Jefferson. There is my information for where you can find me and I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end. So this is what we are going to talk about today. I'm going to give you a little bit of a KonMari 101. And in our poll, you're going to get a chance to tell me whether you have no idea what KonMari is, whether you love KonMari, or where you're somewhere in the middle, because that will really help me think about who's joining today. But no matter where you are, <clears throat> excuse me, on that spectrum, um, you are going to find something that works for you. Um, uh, so then we're going to do a deep dive into the first category. So you're going to learn in KonMari that there's five categories. And the first one is clothing. And we're going to do a deep dive into that so that by the time you're done with this webinar, you can actually begin. You don't just have a fuzzy overview of how it all works. You have a clear step-by-step. -step. I can do my clothing. And usually about halfway through this webinar, people's eyes start glazing over and they already start thinking about like, I'm going to get rid of those pants and that shirt. So you're going to be able to make that happen. I'm going to give you tools for how to make it happen. And um, Gail actually sent you in your webinar, pre-webinar email, <clears throat> a link to a workbook where you can actually start to think about um, you know, your ideal lifestyle, what your plan might look like. And you're going to get that um, workbook in your post workshop email as well. As Gail said, we're going to have plenty of time for Q&A. So as you have questions, please just pop them there in the Q&A box so that Gail can be monitoring those. And then we'll have um, you know, a spot midway and then a spot at the end for you to ask those questions. And then, like I said, you're going to be getting lots of post workshop resources. So you'll have this recording, you'll have the slides, you'll have a little workbook to work through. So there's going to be lots of goodies coming your way. So a little bit about me. This is where I am from. This is what that little dot, tiny dot there. This is what we affectionately call Slower Lower Delaware. So this was my grandmother's farm. It used to be a lot bigger, but since the age of Google Maps, it's been downsized a little bit. But this was, you know, a peaceful, quiet existence. I didn't know the language then, but I was an introvert. 
Um, I was shy, you know, not shy. I was introvert in the sense that I liked quiet. I liked peace, right? So I liked growing up here. My phone number was literally 422 corn, <laughs> which was really fun to discover as a 10 year old. So fast forward to today and what life feels like for me today, it's like so much coming at you, right? It's not that kind of peaceful existence that it used to be. And so I'm going to save you from that slide, give you a little bit of Zen. So, you know, as Gail mentioned, I have had a really beautiful career. You know, I have my MBA and I got to work at one of the best business schools and I've traveled all over the world. And my most recent job was working at a nonprofit in Philadelphia, but I was burnt out. And I was on the verge of a midlife crisis. You know, I was the mom that was racing into the daycare at 5.59, you know, hoping they weren't going to put my child on the curb. And I was really burnt out. And I changed it from calling it a midlife crisis to calling it a creative renaissance. And I was really just curious about how can I simplify my life? Because it wasn't like I was coming home from that daycare <clears throat> and walking into my home and feeling like it was some sort of Zen garden. It was laundry and dishes and stuff and clutter and I couldn't find stuff and everything just felt like I was in a hamster wheel. So I got really curious about something's got to change in my own life. I can only call this a creative renaissance for so long before it really just starts to feel like a midlife crisis. And I started to talk to other people that were really feeling that frazzled nature too. And so there is actually a lot of research about what all this stuff and um, just constant movement and constant going and going and going, like the, the impact that that has on us. So UCLA did a study that showed that there's a relationship, particularly in women, between your cortisol level, your stress hormone, and the number of household objects that you have. So more household objects, more stress, right? And it makes a ton of sense. Like it's all like this cognitive load of things that you're looking at and thinking about and have to clean around and have to figure out what to do with and da, da, da. it's a lot right? So we actually are more stressed out if we have more things. We waste 55 minutes a day looking for things, looking for that email, looking for that lab result, looking for the other cleat, looking for our keys, our sunglasses, whatever it is, right? So it's like spending you know, 12 days a year, your Bermuda vacation, looking for things. So what else could you do in 55 minutes? read the New York Times, have a cup of tea, take a walk, do some yoga, play basketball with your kids, right? Like how can we exchange the rat race for something better? Reducing clutter would actually eliminate 40% of the housework in the average home. And I felt this immediately once I began my own and finished my own KonMari journey. It was like the weekend comes and it's like, what does one do when one doesn't have to clean around a whole bunch of junk all weekend? There was a lightness and there was an ease all of a sudden that just didn't require as much work as it did before. And that's huge. So the creative renaissance led me to this idea of wanting to help people simplify. And so um, before we jump into KonMari, I'd love, Gail, for you to launch this poll because I want to hear from you all. When I say KonMari, how familiar are you with it? So are you super familiar? You've read the book, you've watched the Netflix show, somewhat familiar, you've heard bits and pieces, or you're like, I have no idea what KonMari is. I can't, you know, okay, awesome. So we've got the results coming in. 74% of people have voted. A couple more coming in. Okay. So I think, um, you, Gail, you could probably go ahead and end it and let's see. Okay, great. So this is actually pretty somewhat uncommon because usually we've got everybody somewhere in the middle, but a lot of people are really familiar with, uh, the majority of people are really familiar with KonMari, somewhat familiar and have no idea what KonMari is. 
great. So, okay, awesome. Thank you, Gail. You can go ahead and stop sharing that. So no matter where you are on this journey, and I can click the stop share too, um, Gail, if you need me to, I've got that button here. Okay, I'm going to do that. Um, there we go. Okay, so no matter where you are, you're going to get something out of this. So for those of you that are saying, I have no idea what Kamari is. So this woman, Marie Kondo, who is wearing heels and I am wearing flats. <laughs> I used to, when we would take pictures together, used to do like an awkward crouch. But in this picture, I have embraced our uniqueness and we're just, we're showing it off. So she wrote this book called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, The Japanese Art of Decluttering and Organizing. It came out in the US in 2014. And it really just kind of took the world by storm. You know, organizing and decluttering is nothing new, but the way that she talked about it was something that was really, really different. So at exactly the same time, and I do believe in destiny, at exactly the same time that I was doing my creative renaissance, Marie launched a program where she said, you know, this book has become so wildly popular. It sold 10 million copies around the world. I can't organize 10 million people's homes, but I can have this cadre of professionals that can go out and and help people declutter. So I was trained by Marie Kondo and her team, and I've become certified in the method. So now I work one-on-one -on -one with clients and teach to help sort of bring this sort of hashtag organize the world um, around the world. So why KonMari? You know, for me, I love it because for two reasons. One, it gives us a roadmap. A lot of times with decluttering and organizing, it, the biggest problem is I don't know where to start. And then I don't know how to keep going. It's like, do I do the garage? Do I do the pantry? Do I do the kids room? Like, what do I do? In KonMari is kind of prescriptive. It's prescriptive in a good way because it tells you do this and then do this and then do this. And then the second thing that I love about it is that it answers one very simple question. Does it spark joy? Not have I used it in a year? Might I use it? Could my sister use it? It's a very like getting down to the essence and the root. Does it spark joy? And I, there's a typo there. Does is spark joy? No. Does it spark joy? So what is the method? The first thing is you're going to commit yourself to tidying up. It's not kind of this loosey goosey, well, maybe I'll get organized. When I work with my clients, we set a graduation date. When do you want to finish? Six months from now, a year from now, maybe you're super accelerated, two months from now, whatever it is. And you tell people, it's kind of like if you're doing Whole30 or if you're going to run a marathon, I'm doing KonMari. I'm going to finish KonMari, right? You're going to imagine your ideal lifestyle. So in your workbook that you received and that you're going to get right after this, you'll have a place where you can even jot down, what is my ideal lifestyle? Why do I want to do this? You're going to think about, what do I want my home to feel and look like? Maybe you want it to be crisper and cleaner and white and minimalist, or maybe you want it to be more joyful and have more textures and more colors. Maybe you want to yell at your kids less. Maybe you want to fight with your partner less. Maybe you want to read the New York Times and drink your tea. So what is it that you are trying to create out of this process? We're going to finish discarding first. So this isn't just, oh, I don't need to get rid of everything. I'm just going to put everything in beautiful bas baskets, get a couple of Sharpies and organize. You know, we're not organizing a whole bunch of stuff that we don't need. We're getting a, doing a pretty ruthless declutter to get out a significant amount of things. Again, we're going to ask ourselves if it sparks joy, and we're going to talk about what does that even mean? What does that feel like? We're going to focus on your items first. So it's not, all right, family, we're all doing KonMari, and you're all getting rid of all of your stuff because I said so. This is often the hardest part for people. We're going to work on your items. And yes, we will talk about how to get the other, how to get the family involved and how you might do that, but it really is going to be your journey, at least to start. And you're going to tidy by category, not location. And we're going to talk about what those categories are. And then the last thing, which I love, is that it's very much a use what you have type of approach. So it's not 
okay, we're going to get organized. Let's go to the container store and spend $500 on a bunch of baskets, and then we'll figure out what we're going to do with them. By the time you get done doing that massive declutter, you are going to have so many baskets and bins and drawers and shelves. You're going to have plenty of room for what you need, right? So you don't need to, I have worked with clients before where we've worked together for six months and we literally didn't buy a single organizing product. Okay. So what are the five categories? So they are clothing and that's highlighted because that's what we're going to focus on today. And again, you're going to get these slides. So don't panic. You'll have all this information, books, paper, kimono, and sentimental kimono um, in Japan means like miscellaneous, basically like everything else. So we go through this in this order because you are trying to strengthen those spark joy muscles as you go along. And you don't want to start with grandmother's tea set. You know, that's going to be a big challenge, a big bottleneck. You don't want to start with the cable bill. Does my cable bill spark joy, right? Clothing is a really, really great place to start. And we're going to talk about why, but we do these in order. So what does this crazy spark joy feeling feel like? So you really want to think about it like a spectrum. So on the spectrum, on one end, you have like, oh, I hate this. Get this out of my house immediately. I don't know what it's been doing in here that long. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have, oh my gosh, this is a hell yes. I love this. Let me tell you all about this. This is a non-negotiable. I absolutely love it. And then in the middle <clears throat> is where we get into trouble. In the middle, and this happens a lot when we're shopping, when we're bringing things home. Oh, this is cute. This is nice. It's nice, cute, right? I like it. And at home, well, I don't usually wear it, but everybody should have a black blazer. You know, it's a basic white tee. I never wear it, but it's in good shape. I'm going to keep it, right? So it's in that middle zone. So usually at the beginning, you know, you're not necessarily going to get to when I work with my clients, I'm ruthless where I'm really, really trying to get them on that other end of the spectrum of I love it so that everything that they end up with, they truly love. But you're going to find that you're not going to be so ruthless at the beginning. And there's probably going to be need to be some editing that will happen once you go through the process. So I hope you've been popping some questions in the chat because it is time for our first little pause for Q&A. And Gail, if we don't have any questions, that's totally fine. I can keep marching forward, but I want to give people an opportunity to chime in if they have any. We do have some questions. Yes. Awesome. So one of the questions was, so in the category, she said she doesn't notice things like kitchen, kitchen items, furniture, et cetera. Yes. So that is all kimono. So think of the kitchen, like, so the kitchen is in kimono, bathroom, um, you know, um, uh, you know, the garage, seasonal. So it's basically everything else. And kimono is basically a big category of subcategories. Mm -hmm. And a really great thing to do is I'm actually in the process of creating my own little principle right now. But if you go, if you just Google um, KonMari categories, you'll find really cool printables that you can just print right out, put right up on your fridge. And it'll have all those little subcategories right there for you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because I, I guess that one category could take months. <laughs> There's so much. <laughs> right? like, um, so someone said, I take it one needs to try on each clothing item before making a decision. Great question. So in order not to interrupt your momentum, I suggest creating a maybe pile. And so you're going to create a maybe pile and you're going to try that on all in one foul swoop. But as you're going through the process, you don't want to be like, well, I don't know. Let me try it on. I don't know. Let me try it on. Because then you get into all kinds of weird body image issues and you start kind of, Ooh, I don't know. I don't know. And you feel like on the fence, try set your maybes aside nine times out of 10, the maybes are no's. But just put them aside, give yourself a chance to try them on at the end. Okay, great answer. Because um, I know that can definitely derail you. Um, <laughs> try it on yeah. so many things. Um, so what happens when you're in between two sizes, clothing-wise? Yes, so and we're going to talk about that. 
Okay. Yep. So we'll get to that one. Okay. And then what about um, someone who's trying to get her children on board? She has children that are uh, daughters that are 10 and seven, and they don't really play with their toys anymore, but they don't want to get rid of anything because they still love them. Um, so how do you get kids on board? Yes. Yeah, so we'll talk about that too. So usually kids toys are in that kimono category. So you would really, you know, sharpen your own muscles, go through and do your clothing, your books, your paper. And then when you get to kimono, do all your kimono. And then when you're ready, have kids toys be in that category. Um, and I have a whole blog post, um, that, uh, I'm trying to think of we can, how we can get that to you, but, um, it's all about how to do a toy, toy detox and really, um, so I'll, I'll work with Gail to figure out how we'll get that blog post to you, but okay, I can send it out to the list. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. People that register, that's not a problem. Yeah. Um, so what about, we don't deal with clothing that belongs to other family members, for example, grown children, um, or things that grown children may want to keep, but just don't have time to look at right now. Yes. Oh my gosh. This is such a hot topic right now because as a lot of baby boomers downsize and things like that, they're feeling stuck because nobody wants their, you know, 18 piece cherry dining set, you know, and things like that, or, you know, all of the keepsakes that their children have kept. So usually I do recommend, you know, giving kids a bit of a timeline and saying, Hey, we're, we're streamlining here. We're simplifying. So whatever you want, you know, please look through it by Thanksgiving of this year or next year or wherever it is. But if you don't take a look, I'm just going to assume that you might not want it. Kids usually want a lot less than we think that they do, but you do need to put a timeline on it. So you're not just an unpaid storage facility for the rest of your life. Absolutely. Yeah, setting boundaries is very important, right? Yes. Um, so someone says, as with others, maybe she says she gets held up by the, well, I may use it one day, even if it doesn't spark great joy or it's not even in the neighborhood of joy. So what do you do with those things that you just may need one day, but they're not really um, causing any joy? Yeah, I mean, these days, so I really want people to get closer to that end of the spectrum where it's like, oh, this is a hell yes. I use this all the time. I love this. I couldn't live without this. If it's something, well, I might, da, da, da. Is it something that's like really easy to get? So say, for example, you never make cookies, but you got rid of your rolling pin. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden one day you decided, you know, I do want to make cookies today. You go out and you get a rolling pin, right? It costs you $20, less than 20 minutes. These days you can have things at your doorstep in, you know, a day. So try as best as you can to really, really eliminate those like, well, I might and da, 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 might be useful. I mean, obviously you want to keep things like your fire extinguisher because you might need that one day, but try to keep away from those like mm, could be, could be right. Mm -hmm. And is that the same thing for clothes that don't fit you right now, but you're hoping they're going to fit you again one day? We'll talk about that. Okay. We'll get to that one. Okay. Yeah. Um, and someone said that, you know, that she knows we're starting with clothes and she said she watched a show where Marie said that you have five hours to go through all your clothing and <laughs> did that just for her dressers in her first attempt. And she's nowhere near done. Um, yeah. so she said, can I get another, can I set another two sessions of five hours each? Absolutely. You know, and we'll talk about that as we we will hop into clothing now to make sure we've got plenty of time to cover it. But, okay. um, yeah, so let's hop in there now and we'll talk about that. Okay. We have Thank a few you again. Sorry, Gail. Gail. We have a few more questions, but we'll want to just save them to the end. Just That's be... great. Let's hop into clothing and then we'll get those in the end. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So clothing. Good. Okay. So why do we do clothing first? Because our clothes really set the tone for our day, right? I mean, these days we're not necessarily on the hamster wheel as much as we might've used to have been, but we're running around and we're trying to, you know, get ready and, um, we're late and we can't find the other thing. And so how comfortable you feel physically, how confident you feel, you know, how much you had to rush around and get dressed, like all of that really sets the tone for the day. I always joke that our clothes are talking to us. So really similar to Gail's questions about, well, what about things that don't fit? Um, you know, you walk into your closet and a lot of times it's like, this doesn't fit. I don't wear business suits anymore. You don't look good in teal. Why did you buy something with pleats? I guess we'll just wear the same thing that we always wear, right? It's like that 80-20 rule of 80% of the closet is talking to you and saying that, they, that, that they're not right. And the other 20% is what you need, right? So you want your closet, the conversation that you're having <clears throat> with your closet to be like, come on in, you can't go wrong. Everything that, um, that I, is in here looks great on you at your current size 
right? So you wanna be having a positive conversation with your closet. It's much easier to see what sparks joy. You just have a visceral reaction to things. This is itchy, this is, uh, this is tight, this is, ooh, this is, ooh, I remember, you know, a lot of times our clothes have actually like negative, like, mm, I used to wear this all the time with my ex when we would go dancing. Like there's like feelings and emotions and attachments to the, to clothing. And so um, I usually, when I work with my clients, I tell them, you're frowning, you're sighing, you're, I'm mirroring to them what they're doing. You know, like they literally will do things like, oh, ooh, ooh. Right? and so you're paying attention to what is your body language around that. One of my fellow KonMari consultants calls the clothing session, the installation of hope session, because when the whole house feels completely cluttered and you don't know where to start, but you say, okay, Amanda told me this is a roadmap. I'm going to start with clothing. And then you do your clothing and all of a sudden everything sparks joy and it fits and it feels good and it feels lighter. It's like, oh, I can do this. I'm doing KonMari. So it's like the installation of hope that you can do this, right? So what we're trying to do here is create a virtuous cycle where we do this one major decluttering event where you really put a lot of energy into it. Then you purchase mindfully, and I'm going to explain how to do that. And then you discard frequently and mindfully, because like I said, you probably haven't been as ruthless as I might have you be up here. So when you get to things in your closet that you don't necessarily love, then you're able to let go of them and move on. So how do we do it? So you're going to schedule the five hours to start. So that was a great question. You know, there's no magic number. There's no one size fits all. I think Marie, when she first came to the United States, still held sort of a Japanese expectation of smaller homes, less things, apartment living. And then she comes to the United States and it's like, look at all our stuff, right? So when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with clients, it is very common for us to be able to complete it in five hours, but that's because I'm there and I'm a workhorse and I'm helping keeping things moving and I'm not letting them check their phone. And we're able to, even with the biggest fashionista, get through the majority of their clothes in five hours. That said, if you have a large volume of things if you tend to have a slower working style, then you might need to schedule several, several sessions. And you'll do, you know, your main closet this time and then coats and shoes another time. The, the, the point is to schedule a distraction free time where you're saying to yourself, I'm going to work on clothes from 10 to three on Saturday, not I should try to do clothes some point this week, right? It wants, you want it to be like an event, a time, right? You're going to pile all your clothes on the bed and you're not going to want to. You're going to say, I can just look at them in the closet. They're not bothering anybody. You really want to pile it all on the bed because you need that visceral reaction of, oh my gosh, look how much stuff I have. And you'll start to find things that you didn't know that you had before. You'll start to see things that you hated and you don't understand why they're in there anymore. So we really need that. It's like a jolt. It's like a, poof, like, whoa, this is a lot, right? We need that. But categorize as you go. So shirts, um, pants, pajamas, yoga clothes, because your brain, when it comes time to decide what sparks joy, is not going to be able to process a pile, an enormous mountain. So you want to categorize as you go. And then you'll just start. So with that first category, I like to start with an easy one, whatever is an easy one for you. So it might be pajamas or yoga clothes or whatever it is. And start asking that question, does it spark joy? And I'm going to give you, um, you're going to get uh, a little worksheet that has the six questions that I would ask you if I were in your closet. Like, is it a hell yes? Or how would you feel if you saw your ex wearing this outfit? <laughs> Those types of things. You're going to start asking yourself the question. And at first, you're not going to be so sure. And you're going to put a lot in that maybe pile. But then you're going to get better and better and better. And you're going to start to kind of get in the zone. So just trust that you'll get there. You want to keep a purchase and an upgrade list. So you might find as you're going along, like, oh, well, the reason I don't wear any of these things is because my black leggings have a big hole in them and I need a new pair of black leggings. Great. Add that to the list. Or you might come across 
um, oh, these jeans, I love these jeans, but they're looking a little bit beat up. I think they've got another six months on them, but I, I probably need to upgrade these, right? So that's going to be your shopping list so that when you go out, it's not like, what's cute? I don't know. This is cute. It's going to be like, no, I'm looking for jeans, black leggings, you know, et cetera. You're going to put it back neatly. So I'm going to teach you how to do the KonMari fold. And you can also e easily Google YouTube videos to, um, to find out how to do the, the, the KonMari fold. And then you're going to put the donations in the car and get them away. Even better, you could schedule a donation pickup for the day of or the day after your, your um, decluttering session. And I'm going to have a link in the resources for you of my favorite donation places. It's so important. I just had a client last week, didn't put the donations in the car, put them in the garage, and her mom started picking through them. Oh, but this dress looks so good on you. These shoes were so expensive. Why are you getting rid of this? Get them in the car, get them out of sight. Okay. So this is that little worksheet there of the questions that you can ask yourself. These are the nosy, bossy questions that I would be asking you if I were in your closet. So you're going to get that. Um, for example, number two, if you didn't have it. So for example, a lot of times people the black blazer. It's so like Quinta, like everybody has the black blazer. Well, I should keep this because if I had an interview, so I'll ask them, well, if you didn't have that, what would you wear instead? And they'll say, oh, well, I would probably just wear this wrap dress and some nice pumps. It's like, great. Then you don't need it. Right. So if you didn't have this, um, my favorite, my other favorite one is the question is the answer. So if you find yourself saying, is this too tight? Is this, is this wrong? Is this too short? Is, are these ruffles wrong for me? A lot of times the question is the answer. So because you're asking that question, you're not going to wear it because you're going to pull this out and say, I think this is no. And then you're going to put it back in. Don't put sour milk back in the refrigerator. Don't put sour clothes back in the closet. It's a no. Okay. So now we'll talk about clothes that don't fit. As we talked about, you know, your clothes are talking to you and you don't need that in the morning to start off your day. Tidying is really all about being in the present and having things around us that serve us today. So what I always say is do a joy check of the clothes that don't fit and choose favorites. Choose ones that you say, oh my gosh, I love this top. I love this dress. Da, da, da. I, I, would love to get into it again, and I think I could, and create just a little cheeky box, a label with a cheek, a box with a cheeky label that says skinny clothes I love or something like that, and get it out of sight, not hanging in your closet. It's the one of the few times in the KonMari process that I'm going to recommend, like label a box and hide it because you just don't need it talking to you every day, but it will give you peace of mind that, okay, if and when I am able to wear those clothes again, I know that my favorites are there. And just like that maybe pile, a lot of times when you do get to that size again, you get out the box and you're like, eh, I don't even really need or want these anymore. That happened with me, right? I, I was able to get to the size to actually reach that box again. And then I was like, eh, I don't really need these anymore. I don't really like them. They're not, they're not me anymore, right? So that's fine. You can keep things, keep things that spark joy, put them away. So where to donate, you are going to get that donation guide in your, in your resources. Try to donate where you have a direct impact. You know, Goodwill and Green Drop are great options. And I do love them because they will recycle clothing. That's really just past kind of good use. Um, but it's best if you can to donate to, you know, domestic abuse projects or, you know, homeless shelters or, you know, places that they're actually are going to use those materials locally. Because a lot of times when we donate to these bigger charities, these clothes just end up getting shipped overseas and end up in a landfill there instead, right? So try to donate locally if you can. Especially these days, check wish lists and procedures because a lot of times these organizations are volunteer run. And the last thing you want to have happen is you show up and they receive donations on Wednesdays from 11 to 11.07 around the back door and you've got your car full of stuff. 
and they're not open today, right? So always check that. Um, you can consign newer high-end brands, but I do want you to let go of the idea that you will be able to consign a lot of your clothes and really um, regain any of the value. Um, unless it's like a designer, barely warm, blah, blah, blah. There's such a volume of unwanted goods that are coming at these consigners that they are incredibly, incredibly picky. So that's just something to know. And then the last thing to keep things moving is just keep an outbox in your home. I like to keep like a little basket in my closet. I don't really need it anymore because I'm so ruthless that very little comes in that I wouldn't want. But in this initial stage, keep a little basket in your closet so that when you put that dress on and you say, no, not for me, put it in the basket or even better in a Trader Joe's bag or something like that so that you can very easily say, boop, this is all going to the donations when it's full. So you just keep it moving. Instead of putting it on the chair and I'll put it and figure out how to donate it and all of that, right? So how do we keep less coming in? So you want to keep that shopping list. When you were going through your process, you identified what you needed, right? So keep that, that's your shopping list. Keep it as like a note on your phone so that you can easily access it, right? And then have a really high bar for what comes in. You know, when you're in that line at Marshall's, I'm in that line a lot, uh, ask yourself, would you wait in line 30 minutes for this item? Like, do you love it that much? Where are you going to wear it? You know, a lot of times my clients are like, when they're going through their closet, they're like, well, I would maybe wear this dress to a spring afternoon wedding if it wasn't too chilly. And it's like, that's a lot of requirements, right? You want to have things that you can easily say, well, I could wear this to brunch or I could wear this, you know, I could dress this up. I could dress this down. It's a versatile and it has, you know, a lot going for it versus I would wear it this one time on this one occasion if the weather was just right, right? And then how much are you willing to pay? A lot of times I play a little game where I'm like, ooh, I really like that. I would pay X dollars for that. And then you look at the price tag and it's not remotely close to what in your mind the value of it was. And then so you can let it go. Um, I really like to stick to very few high quality brands. For example, I've identified Eileen Fisher as one of my total favorites. And when, you know, I invest in her clothing uh, because it's high quality, I know that it's going to fit. I know that it's going to last forever. And so I have fewer things, but they're, they're high quality. And then the last thing that I always recommend is to get a color consultation. So my good friend, Jeannie, um, Jeannie is the, called the color guru. And you can see Jeannie, I'm wearing playful today. Um, <laughs> so she, you can actually do a virtual color consultation with her and she'll tell you your best colors to wear, both makeup and clothing. And it'll save you a bazillion bucks because you're not gonna go out there and buy a bunch of things that don't look good for your complexion. Um, and so I always recommend that. So that's gonna be in your resources. So remember I talked about putting everything back neatly, you know, even if the rest of the house feels like total chaos, you can in that first session have drawers that look like this, right? So the KonMari fold is a vertical fold instead of putting everything on top of each other. And you can see that this person even used really simple cardboard boxes to create little dividers. And I'm going to be telling you about in your um, resource list, my favorite Ikea scub drawer organizers that do this job beautifully. It allows you to see everything at once. It prevents that sort of shuffle that happens where things get lost and get shipped to the bottom. And it just feels damn good. And when you look at those drawers, you feel like I've got my act together, right? So this is how you do the KonMari fold. And as I said um, before, you can watch, you, you click, you know, KonMari fold, go to YouTube and you can find one. But essentially you're trying to get the garment into thirds. And then we go to thirds again, okay? So you're gonna lay it flat, face up, and you're gonna bring this shoulder over to the other side of the neck, fold that in. And then you're gonna bring this shoulder over to the other side of the neck, fold that in. 
and you're going to end up with a nice rectangle here in the middle. And you're going to tuck your little sleeve over. If it's a long sleeve, you can do like a tuck, tuck, kind of as a zigzag. And then you're going to take that rectangle, fold it almost to the end, and then fold it into thirds, right? And you can adjust as needed. So say you have really wide drawers or really tall drawers, or you're folding jeans or you're folding sweaters and you can only do a double fold or whatever it is. You can adjust as you go along. And a lot of times, you know, some people say to me, I'm not gonna spend this much time folding my clothes. I hear you, but it's a habit that you develop. And when you get really good at it, um, it actually feels pretty meditative. And these are clothes that you've identified that spark joy for you. And so it's this sort of Shinto Japanese practice of appreciating them, showing gratitude, giving them love, seeing that, oh, this isn't in really good shape or it's got pilling or it's got staining. It's paying attention and treating this thing that you have in your life with gratitude and care. And you'll get so fast at it. And the end result is having drawers that look like that, that feels damn good. So we're bringing it home now. Um, I want to make sure to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So we're going to talk about okay, Amanda, this all sounds great, but how do I actually put this into action, right? So making it happen, what about the rest of the family? So as I said, the best thing is to do your journey first. So you start here at the top, your clothing, your books, your paper, your kimono, that's that everything else category. So that's when you're going to be diving into the kitchen and the linens and the holiday supplies and all of that. And then you're sentimental. And then you get partner and kids involved, right? And maybe even older grown kids that have moved out since, right? Because you're going to be building those muscles as you go along and you're going to become kind of a spark joy samurai, Whereas if you're in the beginning and you've just done clothing and you're feeling pretty good about it, but you're a little, you know, you're a newbie, you're a little bit um, shaky in the beginning. As you're trying to bring your partner and your kids involved, you don't necessarily have the same level of sort of um, knowledge or expectation, expertise, right? But once you've gotten through this, you can bring them involved. And the nice thing about it is instead of the conversation being, we're going to get rid of all your stuff. It's, I have just done this amazing experience of discovering what sparks joy for me. And I'd love to help you figure out what sparks joy for you, right? A lot of times, because you have framed this as an experience or as a commitment, like I'm doing whole 30 or I'm running a marathon, they will have been kind of involved in this process by osmosis anyway. And there might have been some interest along the way. Um, if by some chance, Nobody is remotely interested in getting involved in this. That's one of the big life lessons that you have to just sort of resign yourself to the fact that there's only so much you can control. But what you have controlled are your own things. And that alone should provide a lot more peace and a lot more calm than you had before. So the very next step, you're going to get a workbook where you can jot some notes down about your vision. What is it that I want? Why do I want to do this? What do I want to do more of? What do I want to do less of? Sort of what is this ideal lifestyle that I'm reaching towards? You're going to play with a draft plan. And I'm actually going to show you in a second what that plan might look like. And you are going to schedule your clothing date. You're going to say, okay, I've got my plan and I'm doing clothing and I'm going to start it on X date. Totally recommend getting contractor bags. So those big, heavy bags, because you're going to be clearing out a lot of stuff and regular little garbage bags don't really cut it. Get some Sharpies. I love to get colored duct tape because it's really helpful to slap on the bag. Okay, this is recycle. This is donations. This is, you know, trash or whatever it is so that it's really clear. Um, pick your donation site or schedule a pickup. Get support if you need it. Um, you can even exchange, work with a friend where, you know, will you help me with my closet on Saturday? I'll help you with your closet on Saturday. 
you just need to be really careful that you don't get into it with each other of, oh, you're going to get rid of that green dress. I love that green dress, right? It's all about your joy. I offer virtual organizing and in-person organizing once everybody's vaccinated. So if you get stuck, I'm here to help. Make sure on the day of, eat a really good breakfast and have your snacks, tea, coffee, whatever you need to take little breaks and keep your momentum going throughout the day. So this is what your plan will look like. It's just gonna be this really clean slate piece of paper. And this is what you're gonna do. You're gonna write at the top your KonMari graduation date. So we're in April now, and you're going to say to yourself something like, I'd love to be done this process by the holidays, or I'd love to spend the summer working on it, or I'm going to take this slow and steady. I'd love to be done by spring of next year, whatever it is, right? So put your graduation down, and then you're going to work backwards from that. So then you're going to kind of label the months and assign categories for each, each month, right? So you might put here April. And then May, and it might be April clothing, May clothing, June clothing. You know, you may see that you're going to need some more time to work through each category. Anticipate your obstacles. So, ooh, this month um, I'm getting surgery, or this is a big graduation month, or we're going to be on way on vacation. So just anticipate those ahead of time. I'm not going to be able to do those. And then list any resources you need it, you might need. Like, oh, I'm gonna wanna install XYZ. I'm gonna need a handyman for that. Or once I get the garage done, I really wanna get it painted. So this is an example of what, you know, that plan might look like, right? So you're just gonna map out. So you can see here, this person has said, nothing in May, nothing in April. Um, I'm going to start paper in April, but I have a ton of paper. I know I'm going to need to continue that in June, right? And this person is hoping to be done by February. Um, so that is how you make it all happen. And you're going to have that in your packet. So I know that my friend Gail has a lot of questions for me and I am ready for them. <laughs> you certainly do. You have quite a few questions here. So, um, do you have do you have any you've given some great advice? What about well, for hoarders? You know, what do you do if you have a family member that lives with a hoarder? Um, do you do you work with that at all? I know there's special there. Um, you can Google groups that support groups for hoarders, and there's special people that work with hoarders. But I didn't know if you have that experience. Yeah. So there are KonMari consultants that work with people with hoarding behavior. I'm not one of them because it really does require a special attention. Um, and there are um, professional organizers that are certified to work with people with hoarding behavior. So a great way to find that resource is to go to the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals, which is NAPO. So if you go to napo.net, you can find there um, people that specialize in, in um, hoarding behavior. And I do have a few local resources. So people are welcome to email me and I can send you referrals. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect, perfect. And I know you, you talked about where to donate. And, um, but somebody had a question about, do you know of anything in any place in Northern Delaware just to donate business suits, men's and women's business suits? Are you familiar with any particular place? Um, Northern Delaware. So my favorite place for business suits is um, Career Wardrobe. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if they have a North Delaware location, um, but that's a great resource. Um, okay. But for North Delaware, you know, you could easily access kind of their mainline, um, you know, drop off locations too. Perfect. Perfect. Now, here's a question. Is it possible to do um, KonMari even before having to finish a living place or home? So she says she lives in a big mess of way too much stuff, mostly things that she supposes she needs to, um, to install into a future kitchen, bathroom, bedroom, craft room, et cetera. Um, because um, she got it for free, she couldn't choose the moment to get it into her house. So she wants to use it eventually, um, but now she's living in a real big mess. So <laughs> I mean, it's no real furniture, no wardrobe for clothes, they're just in covered boxes and thrown out a big pile. So that could be a big job for you. So, okay. so any ideas for her? 
Yeah. I mean, you really do. I love when people do KonMari before they are moving because you don't, that way you don't have to schlep a whole bunch of things that you don't love or want or need into your new location. So yeah, I think if you're going to attack that big mess, I would just, for your brain's sake, I would put it into some categories. So I would say, okay, I've got a whole bunch of clothing in this. I'm going to start there and then I'm going to do books and then I'm going to do paper. So divide it up into those categories so that you have that roadmap. Perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And then somebody else asked about that. You know, she has a, doesn't have a stable body weight because of medications. But you say just anything that you don't wear currently, you just put away um, and just label it and put it away. And then you wear it again when the time is right, if you still want. It at that point. Yeah. And if, if, you know, your body weight is fluctuating rapidly, you could always do like a shove aside type of method where in one side of the closet, kind of out of sight, out of mind, you've got the bigger or the smaller clothes and you kind of kind of push those to the side. But I would just group them all together so that they're off the table and they're not talking to you every morning. Right. Absolutely. Very distracting, right? Yes. Very rude. <laughs> very rude. Absolutely. So um, when you're looking at clothes online um, and you want to figure out if they're going to look good on you, as well as if they're going to spark joy, um, do you have a recommendation for color analysis? I know you have, you said, you know, someone who does color analysis, but it's just, if you're looking at things online, I guess sometimes the colors aren't true or do you have any ideas for figuring out if that's going to spark joy? Yeah. So the color analysis is really helpful with that because um, a lot of times, like, so for example, red, I have to wear a really bright, crisp red. It shouldn't be like an orangey red, or if it's mm -hmm. white, it should be a very crisp white. It shouldn't be a creamy white. So mm -hmm. a lot of times I will rely on the reviews for them to say, Oh, this came in like a rust. And I thought it was going to be a bright red, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. So I think, um, if you are doing more online shopping, just kind of prepare yourself to do returns and things like that if they don't come in quite the right colors, because there is a nuance to it. Perfect, perfect, perfect. And then um, where do you suggest that you donate clothes that are nice, but not designer? Mm -hmm. Clothes that are nice, but not designer. Um so I really like, um, and again, you know, things change all the times and you have to check um, what they're receiving. I mean, I um, was using the domestic abuse project. Um, I'm trying to think, was that, was that where I was going for clothes? Um, I, the two consignment shops that I will use um, that aren't necessarily like designer designer, but if it's like J crew or above, Mm -hmm. There's Green Street, um, which has several locations around the area. And then in media is uh, Magic Threads Consignment, who I really like as well. And then there's Clothes Mentor um, as well. But um, if they're not consignable, then I typically will check places like Domestic Abuse Project and things like that to see if they're accepting clothing currently. And if they're not, I will often do like a Goodwill. Um, Philly AIDS Thrift is a really great organization because all of that does stay really local. And so in Center City, Philadelphia, um, you can drop off at Philly AIDS Thrift and they'll keep things local, which is great. I'm sorry, you said Philly AIDS Thrift? Philly AIDS Thrift. And it's great. Philly they do Thrift. have mm -hmm, Philly AIDS Thrift and that's on the donations list, I believe. And they have, it's great. You pull up, a couple of volunteers come out, grab your stuff and it's gone. It's great. Perfect. Perfect. And then someone asked, when you have valuable furniture or art, shouldn't you try to sell it first before you donate it? It all depends on how much energy you're willing to put into it. So... <laughs> You know, that's something people get a lot or stuck on a lot, including my mother. <laughs> you know, I think so if you have a relationship with an auction house, for example, you might say, hey, will you come out and take a look at the stuff? And they might say, yeah, we'll take that. We'll take that. We'll take that. Um, but there might be like a fee to come have them pick it up or they're going to take 60% of the commission or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. There's organizations like Max Sold, which are really good for like major estate planning. And so, or major estate um, sort of transitioning. So they'll come in and they'll say, okay, well, we're going to put online on this online auction, all your tools and all your artwork and all your silverware and all your China. Um, but a lot of times things like, you know, I work with estate salespeople all the time and your beautiful China is worth like $75. And then they're going to take half of that cut. Mm -hmm. So not maybe worth it. Yeah. 
Some people though, enjoy as a hobby, like, oh, I'm going to put this up on Facebook marketplace and see how much I can get for it. And, oh, mm-hmm. I made $50 and that's fun and exciting. Right. So it really just depends mm-hmm. on your interest level. Sure. Absolutely. No, that's really good advice. Thank you. Um, so somebody has a question about gifts. So she gets gifts that she doesn't want, um, but feels badly about giving them away. So <laughs> A kind of shift in mindset can we help her with? <laughs> yes. So a big part of KonMari is the art of um, letting go and the art mm-hmm. of having difficult conversations at times. So I even have a whole blog post about this where, you know, you can feel confident letting that go. You know, the act of the gift is in the moment of the giving and the receiving, right? So that person has expressed their love for you. You've received the gift. And now this gift is your possession and you can let it go. Now, if aunt June comes and asks about the zebra lamp, you can say, (laughs) you know, aunt June, you spark so much joy for me. And I love you. The zebra lamp did not spark joy. So I've let it go. But I, and I want you to know that if I ever give you something that doesn't spark joy, please feel free to keep it moving too. So people are going to start to think you're kind of radical, right? But I think in this culture that we're in, where we're just consuming so much and there's so much stuff, it's refreshing to to be able to say to people like, I'm paring down, I'm having less. And that maybe requires some difficult conversations of, I know you love to give me all these gifts, but could you take me out to lunch instead? That sort of thing. Mm Mm-hmm. Perfect. That's a very good answer. I think a lot of us have those gifts sitting around my house that we feel badly about letting go of. So I think that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, so now when it comes to books, someone says she has a million books, some of them professional and just doesn't know what to do with them. Mm-hmm. Any, any suggestions for books? Yeah, books are funny because they're either, easy, either incredibly easy for people or incredibly hard. There's not really that many people that are in the middle. And you really just want to follow the same, you know, does it spark joy? And you don't want to get into that. I might read it someday type of thing. Cause a lot of times there's like shoulds in there, like, Oh, I should read this. Everybody should read the grapes of wrath, you know, whatever it is, but do I, you know, I had a client once that we divided her books up and she had a a category that was the books that changed my life category, right? Like those were books that she loved and were amazing. And then they got such a prominent place and weren't mixed in with all these other books that she was like, eh, I read it, didn't love it. Or, um, you know, don't really feel like ever reading it again um, or that I'll ever read it. So there's also a lot of things like I should garden or I should cook and therefore I have 75 cookbooks or I should da, 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 da. So there's a lot of shoulds in there. Um, and so try to clear those out, but there's no rule. If you truly love all those books and they truly spark joy for you, like that's okay. You're allowed to keep them. Just make sure that's not, you're not doing it though, just because it seems like an overwhelming task. But if you want to donate them somewhere, is there are places taking books anymore? I know they used to do library drives, but a lot yeah. So usually call your library first because some libraries are accepting donations and some aren't. Um, I really like Better World Books, and that's in my donations guide. Um, and they have bins, and it's great because they'll accept things like encyclopedias and things like that uh-huh. that are actually really hard to get rid of, and they'll recycle them. Um, and they support global literacy, so I really like them as a donation. And in fact. When I donate to my library and they donate whatever they don't want, they actually donate to Better World Books. That's, I never heard of that. That's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so someone says she's been on eBay for a long time, but not very much as a seller. And she'd like to pick up some extra money just kind of for fun, you know, for household items that are worth more than a thrift store. Do you have any particular advice for eBay sellers? Yeah. You know, just do it if it's fun type of thing. Cause it can be frustrating these days. There's just so much stuff that's out there. So if it's fun and you like to mess around with it and lower the price and ship things out and do research and that kind of stuff, then continue with it. But it can be frustrating if you see things that sit there for a long time. Um, but yeah, you always just want to kind of check out on eBay. What are people selling similar things for? Try to price it accordingly, but mm-hmm. just kind of keep it fun and light. Otherwise it could um, be frustrating because there's just, there's not a huge market for a lot of things right now because there's just Mm -hmm. so much stuff out in the world. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I know your answer to this question, but if you are out and you see a top or a pair of pants you like, but don't know if it'll match what you already have in your closet due to so many shades of colors, what do you recommend? So 
you know, if it's a top you like, make sure it's not like, oh, this is kind of cute. And this is, eh. make sure oh, you, this top is amazing. It's gorgeous. I love it. I could see dressing it up. I could sit like, it's a hell yes. You're so excited. You would wait in line 30 minutes for that top. You're really, really excited about the top, right? So then you bring it home, but it doesn't go with other things and just be prepared to take it on back. Mm -hmm. um, but I say a lot of times, like do your future self a favor. If I'm on the fence and I'm like, eh, I don't really know if I like this top, I'm pretty busy. So I don't really have a lot of time to go back to the store and return it and da, da, da. So a lot of times I'll just sort of say, do your future self a favor. You don't love this thing. You don't need it. Just let it go. And then we don't have to do the whole returning rigmarole. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, somebody commented, buying nothing is wonderful too. <laughs> Never yeah, buying nothing be a, really a good lot deal. of time. Yes. Absolutely. And money, right? Yes. And when you donate clothes, do they need to be cleaned first? It's always a good recommendation, I think. I don't think you necessarily need to have them professionally cleaned, but a lot of times, yeah. sometimes I'll even, yeah, when I'm about to donate something, I'll throw it in the wash first. And then when it comes out, I'll put it in my donate pile. Gotcha. Okay. All right. And then somebody asked about clothes that, you know, come from the cleaners or they're right out of the dryer and you know, to put on hangers so they don't get wrinkled. She said, you know, cause she knows that the Kamari is about folding things. Is that okay? You have hangers with the Kamari method. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I hang a lot of things and I'm kind of a lazy folder hanger. So I like to have things hung. Um, so totally fine to hang things. You don't have to feel like you have to fold everything. Everything. Okay. And then how do you deal with putting away bras and like flimsy undergarments with like yeah. camisoles? Yeah. So, you know, you can use smaller dividers so that they are kind of propped up really nicely. And with your bras, you know, they always say you don't want to turn one inside out and stuff it inside the other one because that can make it misshapen. So you want to kind of lay them long and out displayed so that you can see all of those. But um, yeah, when I'm like on point and I'm really on top of things, I do have like my underwear folded beautifully KonMari style in a smaller uh -huh. shoe box. Um, so that's a really great option, but they're a little silkier, a little, you know, they move around a little bit more. So you usually need a smaller box for those. Smaller box. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, well, that's really, I don't know if I can get that far, but. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I have to be really on my game. You have to be in the mood. Right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And then somebody asked about it, when you're folding clothes so much, when you're putting so many folds in them, does that provide a lot of wrinkles? You know, it just, it depends. So a lot of times, if you're, if that's something that you're worried about or that you're finding that it is, um, then feel free to either hang them. Or if you're, you know, I always say, if your current folding style is working for you, like if it ain't broke, it broke, don't fix it type of thing. Right. Um, right. but if you've got a ball of clothes in there and you can't find everything, da, da, da. but if you're finding that the KonMari process does wrinkle them, then feel free to go. But I find that they stay fine. I tend to fold things that are like my pajamas or my underwear or my mm -hmm. jeans or sweaters or things like that, that aren't really going to be impacted by wrinkling. Um, mm -hmm. but if you're really worried about it, then feel free to hang it or fold it in a way that works better for you. Oh, okay. Okay. And then what about, do you recommend rolling towels instead of folding them? Um, so you, I, it depends on the setup that you have. So, you know, I fold my towels and, you know, I actually do do a hotel roll, not necessarily a KonMari roll, but just a roll. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I have them so that you can see each roll kind of, but um, yeah, you want to do it in a way that you avoid all the avalanches and that sort of thing. But it depends on are things in a basket or on in a drawer. So it kind of depends a little bit. On the space that you have. Okay. Yeah. And somebody is just 90% um, of her clothes are on shelves in her closet and she uses shelf dividers, but she can't see everything if she puts things in bins and then she loses the space height on the shelf. So what would you recommend instead of stacking? Mm-hmm. So... I do like using clear bins with a little cursive label on them, like in a Sharpie or something that says camisoles or PJs or whatever it is so that mm -hmm. you can take that bin out, get what you need and then put the bin back. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. If you're finding that stacking things on the shelves is causing avalanches and you're not being able to see. So sometimes that clear label, clear bin with a nice pretty label on it can be helpful. Oh, okay, excellent. So Gail, before we take another question, I just, since I know we might have a couple people that pop off um, at the at the hour mark, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knows where to find me. So 
If you want to get these um, top, I send weekly top three uh, tips emails. If you want to get those, feel free to sign up at indigoorganizing.com. And I actually have a brand new first time ever online course coming out in a couple of weeks. So if you want to know about that, make sure you sign up. Oh, thank you very much. And, and just, so, just in case anybody else needs to hop off, I just wanted to thank everybody for attending. We'll, we'll answer the um, other questions. Amanda has a few more minutes. Um, but I wanted to thank everyone for attending. If you have to hop off, I just want to let you know you're going to receive like a five question survey. Um, we just ask you to take you back two, not even two minutes to fill out. It's just like, just, just select you want to answer for each. You can add a little comment if you like. Um, but we, that would help us as far as feedback what you like and if you have ideas for future webinars just let us know um you're also going to receive a follow-up email on um, tomorrow afternoon that will have a link to this recording as well as all the resources that amanda um told you about as well as her slides so all kind of information so be sure you look for that tomorrow and um you know and you can and you'll also get a link as i said to the recording and and it'll also have a recording of all our past bonus webinars that you can look at um also just real quickly i want to let you know about our upcoming bigger programming so this thursday on april 15th we're starting a three-week um, three-part yoga nidra series on Thursdays from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And for those of you who aren't familiar with yoga nidra, it is a restorative guided relaxation process that's done lying down. So it's supposed to be like an hour of yoga nidra is supposed to be equivalent to four hours of sleep for your body. It's very relaxing and very rejuvenating. Um, so if you're um, interested in that, we'd love to have you join us. And of course, the recordings will be on our website too. And then our next Vigor Wellness webinar which is called Meeting the Cycle psychological challenges of COVID-19. And that's going to be held from 2 to 3 p.m. on Tuesday, May 18th. Um, so the follow-up email that you'll receive tomorrow will have um, a link to learn more about each of these programs and also the register. Um, so just wanted to let you know about that. And so if you have to leave now, thank you for joining us. And if you can stay for just a few more minutes, we just have a couple more questions, okay? Oh, we have a comment that the Conmore um, style folding is fabulous when packing for trips. Somebody is, uh, said they really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, let's see, so we have somebody wants to know about how about books in a foreign language? Is there a place that you can donate those? You ever heard of that one? Um, that's a really good question. The first thing that comes to mind, I mean, you can absolutely donate them to Better World Books and they can help find a place for it because they, they resell those types of things. But um, I think sometimes you can, I know it's hard to find foreign language books on Amazon sometimes. So you might be able to actually sell those types of books back to Amazon. So that's an idea, but I would try Better World Books. Right, right. Okay. No, that sounds like a great idea. Mm -hmm. and, we have questions, and I know you just have a few more minutes. So I'm just, I'll try my best and then um, to see, you know, see what we can do. Yeah. Um, and people, they, people can always email me. So if they didn't get their okay. question answered, they can feel free to email me. Okay. That sounds good. Um, so, and what about um, old makeup or shower gels? You know, those little hotel things that you get, like, what do you do with um, those sort of things? Is there, I would just let those go. I would not worry about finding donation locations for those. A lot of times the shelf life is quite short for those things. So I would just okay. let them go. Yeah. Okay. And how do you justify getting rid of something that was expensive? <laughs> I know that's such a common question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that thing is not paying, writing you a check. It's not sending you a dividend. It's, you know, a lot of times what it's doing is just producing like feelings of guilt. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you might be able to consign it, but if not, just be inspired by the fact that it's going to spark joy for someone else. And it's no longer going to, you know, have that guilt. You're not mm -hmm. going to have that guilt anymore. So Absolutely. it's just a matter of letting it go. Yeah. How guilt much joy is still relevant? Exactly. Right. Absolutely. Guilt and joy are on two ends of the spectrum, right? So we don't want anything that's going to make us feel guilty. Um, what were the IKEA ideas that you mentioned? You mentioned so my favorite um, IKEA drawer dividers are called SCUB, S-K-U-B-B. -B. Um, and they're really great. They come in a small square, a rectangle, and then a bigger square. And I think they come in a pack of six and they're incredibly affordable. Um, and I like them because you could even put just one in the middle of a drawer and then you've created three sections, right? Mm -hmm. Just by mm -hmm. using one as a divider. So those are really great um, choices. Oh, okay. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody says they've been um, decluttering by giving things that they've inherited to family members um, who love them, you know, particularly the younger generation. So they've kind of found a way to re-gift their, um, their things that they don't need anymore. Yeah. Um, and somebody wants to know about what do you do um, 
when your husband reclutters what you've just decluttered. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the other human beings that live with I us. know, such a problem. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of when you declutter your things, you know, your clothing, your books, your da, 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 right? So you you do have, you have retained some control over your own things. Now, when you get into the garage and the kitchen and the da, 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 and the shared spaces, like that does get hard, um, especially when you're dealing with kids and things like that. So, you know, you really just want to make sure that you're um, focusing on your things, but I would probably, with this question, I would want to dig in more and like understand, well, what is it that he's recluttering and why do you think he's doing that? Because it might be like a system or a habit that needs to be put in place. But um, yeah, so there's probably like a more digging that would need to happen to answer that question. Gotcha. Okay. All right. That sounds, that sounds good. It sounds good. It'd be a therapy session, right? <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what about, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what about constantly changing styles? Like one year narrow legs are in, the next year wide legs are in. So should you save those things so you can, you know, have them when they come back in style? Um, I my answer is usually no. I mean, it kind of depends on what sort of fashionista you are. And if you truly will, like, you kind of have to know yourself, like, are you truly going to know like, oh, it's wide leg time. And look at these wide leg pants that I say from 10 years ago, and they're coming back again. So I'm going to bring them out of the closet. I think most of the time we don't do that. And we think things are going to come back in style, but then they do. And then we don't. So I usually just like to keep it really simple. And does it spark joy? Would you wear it now? Stay in the present. And then if a trend comes back around again or something, then you can participate in it at that time. But I usually tend to be ruthless and Mm, just get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because lots of times there's other changes to the fashion. Not only is it the legs, but it's the colors or the you know this the different styles. So it is very it can be very challenging. Um, yeah. And um, so we have like one more question, and then and then I think we're done. So I so somebody has a client that lived in Japan for forty years and has a lot of very high end Asian art. So a local college has some of it, but wants it appraised before taking it. So where do I begin to research that? Do you have any idea about that? Yeah. So I would talk to, um, yeah, I would just, I would reach out to like a local art dealer and get their recommendations on how to get those things appraised and, and what to do about that. And, um, yeah, I would, I would just reach out to a local art dealer and they'll be able to point you in the right direction. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. And, oh, and then somebody did say, what should we do with wool sweaters that are in good condition or new, but we do not wear. So that would just be in your donate pile. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, somebody said this has been very helpful, encouraging and inspiring. And um, she says she's older and tells all the young people in her life and sometimes strangers don't buy or keep a bunch of stuff. I think the current generation doesn't want as much stuff, which I think is true. Yeah. Um, much, you know, they don't have as much room and they, people, I know some of the downsides people that have come talk with us said just first thing to know is your kids don't want your stuff, you know, <laughs> Yeah, there's such a great book that came out a couple of years ago that's called Swedish Death Cleaning. And it's really funny. And the woman that wrote it, she jokes that she's somewhere between 70 and 90 years old. And she basically says that, you know, she tries to declutter so that her loved ones aren't left with the whole bunch of stuff that they really just don't know what to do with. And so if you mm -hmm. truly pare down to all that you love and need, and whether you're 70 or 90 or 40, that mm -hmm. applies, um, you know, oh, absolutely. It's much easier. Absolutely. Oh, and somebody says to try an art museum or um, other museum collectors for that, you know, for the person with the Japanese um, art collection question or mm -hmm. check local universities um, to see, you know, if they were going to donate them to see if they want those for their collections. Mm -hmm. um, things. And um, so got some great, lots of comments about excellent presentation and it was very inspiring. So with that note, I'd like to thank you very much, Amanda, for being here and thank everyone for joining us today. And like I said, you'll get this recording um, on Wednesday afternoon. And uh, Amanda, thanks so much for all these wonderful tips. I think you've inspired us. I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed at the thought of all I have to do, but I... <laughs> <laughs> overwhelmed and inspired that's about and right inspired because I, I know you're absolutely right I feel much better when I get when I go through my clutter and I kind of declutter a bit so I, I think that's a pretty common feeling so yeah. <clears throat> excuse me thank you very very much and thanks everyone thank you and have a wonderful day Take okay care. bye, bye.